Our scripture today is from St. John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the wine knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. <laughs> Kathleen Norris has a wonderful small book from a lecture series that she did on women's spirituality. She titled her book, Quotidian Mysteries, Laundry, Liturgy, and Women's Work. That was her title. Quotidian is one of those big words that if you're like me, is not in your vocabulary. I had to look it up. It means ordinary. The theme of her book is how ordinary things can shape a powerful spiritual life. And she begins by telling the story of how she came to faith. And the very beginning part of that was, well, she was not a follower of Jesus. She was a guest at a wedding. And at the wedding mass, she saw the priest serve at the table and then in the ritual clean up afterwards and she elbows her boyfriend whom she later married and she says look the priest is doing the dishes and she describes the priest in her memory as a daft housewife overdressed for the kitchen and you know like if you saw me last week as we were serving at the table I was wearing a robe and stole I mean when you wear all that stuff you are a little overdressed for the dishes but you know, the most important things that we do in the church when we gather together around the table of the Lord or around the font all involve dishes. Simple, ordinary stuff. They involve bread and grape juice. They involve water. For her, this glimpse of the ordinary, the quotidian, became for her the window through which she could observe, understand, and finally touch the glorious mystery of God, and begin a journey that brought her to faith in Jesus Christ. So we're in a series of messages that uh, is around transformation themes. I'm taking it out of the, the biblical themes that I, I wove into my song, Earth, Water, Wind, and Fire. Um, last week we had turn these dust and ashes into praise, and today it is turn this holy water into wine. And we have the story from John 2 in which Jesus did turn the holy water into wine. And we also have the story in John chapter 3, the very next chapter, in which Jesus speaks about being born through water and the Spirit. Born through, born through water and the Spirit. Born through water and the Spirit. Okay, all right. Well, you're with me. Very good. It's starting to get a little worried there. Let's pray. Lord God, we thank you for your word, 
for its mystery and wonder. We thank you for ordinary things which serve as windows or icons for your glory and presence among us. And we pray that you will help us to draw near. In Jesus' name, amen. So when my family first got involved in going to church, I was almost 10 years old. So my early childhood, that wasn't part of the experience. And once we got into churches, it was in that brand of Christianity in which any consumption of alcohol was taboo. Now, having grown up all over the world, I learned how to fit into any different culture, including this particular religious culture in which I was located Although I did take some private pleasure in how much effort some folks spent in explaining this particular miracle of Jesus when you are so rigidly committed to abstinence. Because when folks would try to explain miracles of Jesus like serving 5,000 people with a sack lunch or the miracle of Israel getting through the Red Sea with the water piled up on each side, that was labeled liberalism, but you still have to bring some explanation to this particular thing. It had to be non-alcoholic wine, despite what the steward says. It had to be new wine served pre-fermentation, or you know, the water wasn't fit to drink, though there's less pollutants in that age than there is today. Isn't it ironic, don't you think? Folks tie themselves up in pretzels to deal with this particular story because it's so much easier to talk about prohibition than it is to talk about pleasure when it comes to faith. You may be thinking, just for a moment, what about Christchurch and alcohol? And I'll take that question, even though it's not the focus today. Um, what does the Bible have to say about, uh, about alcohol and consuming alcohol? The biblical counsel is to avoid impairing our judgment. That's pretty clear. Um, Jesus also made and enjoyed good wine. That's in the stories. What about the heritage of the United Methodist Church? The United Methodist Church has a long tradition of abstinence and played a major role in the prohibition movement. And what about Christchurch and JP, you? Um, well, there's enough addiction in my family history and in my own personality for me to be careful about developing any destructive habits. And here we are careful to show respect and honor to our brothers and sisters that are in recovery by, among other things, serving grape juice rather than wine when we gather around the Lord's table. But back to this irony that I enjoyed, the way people turned themselves into pretzels because they were so focused on prohibition instead of pleasure. This, this huge gap, it just is very much exposed in this particular text. The difference between a life that is obsessed with rules and a life that is full of fun. Most of us have some bit of Mr. Monk in, our, in us. Any, I know this isn't on TV anymore. Anybody still remember this one? Wasn't that a great show? Oh my goodness, that was just wonderful. That wonderful and obsessive TV detective, we've got a little bit of him in us, most of us, at least enough to recognize how much effort we put into protecting ourselves from things going dreadfully wrong. We count everything, we script conversations, we have a long list of things that are taboo for us, even if they aren't for everyone else, because it's necessary for us to keep ourselves balanced and to move through life. Do you hear any echoes of that zealous protection against danger and disaster in the words of Jesus' mother in this story? Maybe she was assisting the caterer, we don't know. She comes to Jesus and she says, they're out of wine. By the way, she was not simply relaying information. You can tell by Jesus' response. She was giving what we call generously today a hint. <laughs> Do you hear that kind of need to protect? Because we're on the edge of failure, Jesus. We have nowhere to turn. The, this feast is gonna go bad real fast. Life is about to unravel. Unfortunately, such fear-filled efforts have been a key feature of religious practice. And it's why so much of religion is about prohibition and about taboo. So little of religion is about pleasure, about joy, unlike true faith. Biblical faith is joyous faith. 
Biblical faith is full of the pleasure of God. So I always love the story of Eric Little in that old movie, Chariots of Fire. He's a great runner, the flying Scotsman competing in the 1924 Paris Olympics, but he has to defend his choice to do so to his sister. They've both grown up in China. They were born in China. He had a higher calling to serve God as a missionary in China. And he says, I'm not abandoning that call. That is my calling. After the Olympics, he said, God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his. <sighs> I don't know if you found that thing that when you do it, you feel the pleasure of God. I hope you begin to discover that if you haven't yet. So Jesus' mom comes to him and says, they're out of wine. And where does Jesus turn once he finally decides to intervene? Jesus turns to the servants. Jesus turns to those who are overlooked, those whose potential is ignored, those whose personhood is denied, those whose possibility is prevented by the very structures of society. These are the ones who participate in and witness the miracle. These are the ones who take the water from the jar to the master of ceremonies only to have it turn into wine somewhere along the way. Jesus turns to the servants. Jesus also turns to water. You know, Jesus doesn't conjure cash to buy a few more wine skins. Jesus doesn't pass the hat to help this unfortunate young couple out of this disaster. Jesus doesn't do any of the normal things that we would think of to deal with a situation that seems to be poor in resources. Jesus finds resources in the unlikely, ordinary places in the servants, and in the water. I love the scene in the film, The Princess Bride, where Inigo, Wesley, and Fezzik are preparing to storm the castle. They're planning their assault. And Wesley has recently been mostly dead, and he's been resuscitated by a giant chocolate pill, because that'll resuscitate anybody. But they're still having to hold him up. He has no particular strength in his body, and he says to them, so what are our resources? What do we have for this battle? And Inigo says, my sword, his strength, your brains. Can't do it. It's impossible. If we only had a wheelbarrow and a cloak. We have a wheelbarrow and a cloak. We just didn't list those ordinary things among our resources. They were in the inventory. But when we're focused on an impossible task, whether it is staving off social disaster at the feast, or storming a fortified castle, or following all those prohibitions or obsessions that define our lives, when we are focused on such impossible tasks, we completely overlook the mundane resources that God offers us. We ignore the lowly who have more to offer us than they need from us. We forget about the wheelbarrow and the cloak, and we see ourselves as nothing more than common water. If you pay attention to astrophysics, you'll know water is not that common in the universe. It's a pretty special thing. And it has all kinds of neat properties. For one thing, it can take any shape, which is really, really cool. When, however, we commit to living in God's dreams for us, when we commit to live in the presence of God, this holy water is turned into wine and the good stuff at that. We move in our lives from prohibition to pleasure. We discover that the ordinary is laced with mystery and the lowly are graced with power and Jesus moves from a guest in our busy lives to the host of the party, his rightful place. When we ask God to turn this holy water into wine,
Make every human part of me divine. We are asking for more of God in us, more grace, more mystery, more potential, more impact. And in this transformation process, the crucial element, the single element that is under our control is the movement of Jesus from guest to host. It happens when we listen to the direction of Jesus' mother. What does she say? She says, do whatever he tells you. Once we listen to that, once we obey, we move Jesus from guest to host, and at that moment we receive the promise that's offered in the very next chapter, the promise of new life in the Spirit, born of water and the Spirit. I remember reading through those passages in John's Gospel with a group of folks in one congregation and one young woman who was in the group was reading this section in John 3, born of water and the Spirit, and she said, I get it. This says I can have a new life. When Jesus goes from host, from guest to host, when we follow his mother's advice, do whatever he tells you, everything changes. Lord, we thank you that even today you turn water to wine. We thank you that even today you take the ordinary us and do extraordinary things. And we pray that you'll give us grace to do whatever you tell us. To move you from guest in our lives to truly the host of life itself. Pour out your spirit on us gathered here and on this gift of water. May it be a reminder, a gateway, a sign, and the birth itself, that dying and being raised with Christ we may share together in that new life of the Spirit, born of water and born of the Spirit. And that we may find confirmed in us faith, hope, and love in abundance. Amen and amen. Remember your baptism. Remember your baptism. I invite you today as we sing our next hymn, which is a baptism.